Uh, first of all, a very good afternoon. I hope uh, it's good afternoon there in Germany. So yes. we, we are in India. It's, it's an evening. It's 4.30 uh, p.m. in India. So a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to today's IRE talk. And today's topic is, do we need a paradigm for marketing? I'm Professor Sandeep. From the team GIBS Business School Bangalore, and it's my honor to host today's session. I must say this that today we have an amazing personality, uh, not from India, but yes, uh, he's been through various different places probably France, Germany, West Africa, a lot of things. So before we begin, let me introduce you all to GIBS. GIBS Business School Bangalore is based in Bangalore, managed by Goel Educational Trust which is a prestigious institution which offers AICT approved PGDM program and BBA program from Bangalore University. Our faculties emphasizes mentorship and practical learning for preparing students for the industry through programs such as GIBS Finishing School and GIBS IRE School. With a strong track record of placements in top-notch companies, GIBS ensures a bright career prospects. At Gibbs, we foster innovation, research, and entrepreneurship. Our mission is to empower individuals for personal as well as the professional growth. Developing leadership skills, facilitating networking opportunities. Today, we are honored to have Professor Dr. George Boucher, a distinguished indiv individual with a remarkable academic background. Mr. George is born in Stuttgart, that's Germany. Professor George has lived in various countries before establishment for his marketing and strategic consultancy. John, uh, Mr. Boucher and Jacob in Berlin with an experience in Spain, China, and Germany. He specializes in international business, marketing, strategic sales, business development for established firms and startup. Professor is a full-time, uh, Dr. George is full-time professor at IU International University in Germany, which is one of the largest universities of Germany. He has taught various institutions in Spain and even in France. He also holds a doctorate from Liverpool John Moores University, and he is the honorary consul of Republic of the Gambia for a specific reason in Germany. Professor is also actively involved in a lot of philanthropist activities. He's also running a lot of schools in Gambia, that's in West Africa. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are really happy and honored to have you on today's IRE talk. So before we begin, uh, just one last uh, information I would love to give it to the audience. Uh, I would love to encourage the audience to participate in the IRE talks and make the most of this opportunity to learn from Professor. We can have the Q&A session at the end of sessions. So please feel free to put down your questions, any doubts you have in the Q&A section. We will take it at the end of the session. So over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the nice um, presentation and the warm welcome. It's a great honor to be with you. And I will dig right into um, our little session today. And you can interrupt me at any time or you can um, ask questions at any time. Please feel free. Let me quickly share my screen so you hopefully can see um, everything right now. Well, Perfect. So um, the big question is, I th think you will all be um, future managers or you might be entrepreneurs and um, everything you have to know about uh, when you set up your company or when you work in a company, you have to be innovative, you have to research and you will see why and you'd have to think about your strategy. So marketing and strategy are closely related and um, you've all learned quite a bit about strategy and marketing already in a business school. Um, and um, I just want to give you a little short summary and have a discussion with you. Um, I was already introduced. I am very happy to be a university professor. And our university in Germany, IU, currently has 135,000 students enrolled. So uh, that is quite big. And um, I also enjoy, like uh, Mr. Sandeep said, lecturing in Spain and in France, for example. I take the train to France. It's very handy. And I go to Mexico once in a while. So that is a very nice. So also besides being an entrepreneur, you, I mean, in the future, you can also always think about a career in um, 
education and university. That is always interesting. And you can contact me anyway, anytime. You'll find me on LinkedIn. So if you have any questions in the future about uh, entrepreneurship, marketing, or um, even lecturing in the future. And uh, my wife is uh, from Asia. My wife is from Vietnam. Um, so I'm also lecturing once in a while in Vietnam, but uh, this was organized through a colleague of mine in France. So uh, my wife is always happy when we get a chance to go to Vietnam, as you can imagine. So um, it looks quite a bit here, 27 universities. Of course, you can't be uh, with them um, all the time. So I'm um, sometimes holding a lecture here, a lecture there um, as a guest lecturer, which is uh, very nice. Um, I've also experienced quite a bit uh, on television as a TV host, and I've been working with um, one of the biggest touristic companies. There was a hand up. Please go ahead. If you want to ask something, feel free. It's quite comfortable. So not, not, nothing to worry, sir. All right. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much. So I've also collaborated quite a bit with one of the biggest touristic companies in the world in Munich, and um, marketing and sales are closely related. So I've also worked as an international sales director uh, in Germany and for several companies also as an international sales manager, but I don't want to bore you with that. One thing that is quite interesting is when you work in a company, even if you're employed or if it's your own company, you will always have to think about business development and coming up with new products, but we'll get into that into in a little while. So Mr. Sandeep Bansali already mentioned, I have a sales and marketing consultancy together with my partner. His name is Roman Jakob. And um, well, we are based in Berlin and everything was fine until we dealt with um, Americans because the Americans, when they looked at the name BJ, they thought of something perverted. So uh, I don't want to repeat it, but you can imagine. So you always have to be careful uh, when you uh, decide about your name. And with our consultancy, we decided to use our last names. And BJ maybe was not the best decision uh, to use that uh, when you deal with Americans. Um, I also was an entrepreneur myself. I set up a snowboarding company. I love to snowboard, be out there in the mountains uh, with the snow. So I always encourage you to think uh, not twice. If you have the right connections, if you have uh, some funds that you can get from a bank, don't think twice. Um, you might later regret it if you don't set up a company. And uh, like I said, feel free to contact me anytime. So I also wanted to return something to society. So I started um, getting very active in West Africa. Nowadays, we have 12 nursery schools running there uh, with our own charity. So I think it's always good to return to society. And in our case, we're helping kids in West Africa. And I got very involved in the Gambia. And the crazy thing was that the Gambian government said, you want to be our representative? We don't have a, we don't have a ambassador, an ambassador in Germany. Do you want to become our representative in Germany and our honorary consul? And I was very um, proud and happy. So I'm now representing the Gambia um, as their official um, diplomat in Germany. And it's called honorary consulate. And honorary means uh, it's a great honor and you're not receiving any money. So also, if you want to get involved in diplomacy, also let me know. I'm here for you um, anytime. Um, what I also experienced um, was working in different countries, and I think that is a very good school. I mean, you go to university, you go to business school, and you acquire some um, work experience. And um, I would always advise you, well, yeah, look around a little bit. And if you want to set up a company, that's amazing. But also, if you work in a company, you can gain some excellent experience so at the end of the day, you decide which will be your path. Um, another job closely related to marketing was um, in an advertising media agency also in Germany. That was one of my first jobs after my bachelor degree. So that was also a very good school learning how advertising actually works. And then um, I've also worked since, or I've been working with LinkedIn as a tutor, um, well, sort of producing all sorts of videos with LinkedIn learning. So that was also a very interesting experience, but I don't want to bore you too much. So I would like to get down to business and um, we'll see um, if we need a new paradigm for marketing. And first of all, we all get lost when we hear words that we don't really understand. And I personally, I'm from Germany. 
I speak English, but paradigm, the word is very similar in German, but still I think it's quite complicated to know what it means. So we could say a paradigm is an example or pattern of something, a pattern or a model. So to put it in simpler words, we could also say, do we need to rethink marketing? Do we need to rethink how we organize our marketing in our company? Do we need a new model or a new pattern or a new design for marketing? So all we'll be talking about today is um, how should we implement marketing? What could be um, marketing in general in our company? And um, how can we make use of that if we want to be entrepreneurs? And you will see that we'd have to be innovative and we'd have to research. Otherwise, we will have difficulties succeeding. So we are all aware of a so-called paradigm shift. And the big question is, will traditional marketing die off? Will it survive? And we've all seen traditional marketing such as radio, television, newspapers and um, well, personal face to face marketing, so to say. And now we all are using Instagram, LinkedIn, we're using Facebook, we're using a TikTok and Snapchat, and we're using online marketing, Google Ads. So we all agree, well, of course, and we're all aware there is a change from traditional marketing to digital marketing. But um, let's take a look. Um, we are all aware of the so-called four P's of marketing. And when we set up a business, imagine you set up a business and you want to uh, produce, let's say, fresh juices. You'd have to think of your product. What kind of uh, fruits will you use? How will the design be of your bottles? You'd have to think, where do you want to sell them? Will you work with distributors and you wouldn't set up your own shops? And um, what will be the price? Will it be a high price product, a low price product? And how will you promote your juices? And you'd have to think of your target market. So when we set up a company or when we work in a company or when we are at business school or university, we will all come across the 4P model, which was introduced in the 1960s by McCarthy. And um, well, there were other models like the 7 or 12P models or the 4C model where, where we say we'd have to think of customers, costs, convenience and communication. So all uh, these ideas with the 4P, uh, 4C, uh, 7P or 12P model is a typical marketing, typical marketing tool. And uh, what you've also learned in business school in marketing and in strategy class is Porter's five forces model when we try to analyze a market. So imagine you want to come up with an electrical car company. You'd think about the power of your suppliers. You might be um, afraid of new entrants or substitute products. Why would people suddenly not want to buy electrical cars anymore? The buyer power, do people want to buy Tesla or not? Do they like Elon Musk or not? So you could use this model also. And um, you're all aware of the product life cycle. And I've put down some typical examples. Uh, when you set up a company, you come up with your product, you will introduce it, it will grow, uh, it will mature, and it might decline. That's why Volkswagen and Apple always come up with new products. Uh, they will uh, renew their products. So all these models, you are very familiar with them. And um, you might have seen the AIDA model where you try to create awareness and interest and desire and action. So that means you try to make people aware of your product or service. Uh, you want to get them interested in your product or service. You want to create some desire. You want them to have it. And then you have to sort of um, make them buy your product. That's why action is part of the AIDA model. So what I'm trying to say is um, when you have a marketing class, when you have a strategy class, when you have a business uh, class, you will come across so many different models like the PEST or PESTEL analysis or the SWOT analysis, the ANSOF matrix and the EDA model and the 4P model. So the idea is uh, this is everything we learn in business school at university and these tools are excellent. But the question is, um, okay, is that still suitable? And I would say, yes, it's still suitable, but we'd have to take so many different things into account when we do marketing, when we get involved in strategy, and when we want to set up our own company. And um, you might have heard of Oilevy. Oilevy is one of the biggest um, advertising agencies in the world. And there is a gentleman called Brian. And I'm always afraid when I have to pronounce his last name, Fetters Tono. Um, so I prefer to call him Brian. So Brian Fetters Tono said, come on, well, the 4P model is really outdated. So we'd have to think about something completely different. 
So when we think of marketing, we want to set up a company, we think about product and service, our price, where do we want to sell it, place or distribution or sales channels, promotion, how do we want to advertise for our um, for our uh, product um, or service. So he says we really have to um, go away from the traditional view, from the 4P model, and we have to think of the 4E model. So he says, we have a new paradigm in marketing and the 4E model stands for experience, exchange everywhere and evangelism. So I find that quite interesting when you keep that in mind in the back of your head, when you say it's not about a product or service you're buying. So I personally, I've become a, a friend of Apple. Um, I, I would say Samsung might even be better quality, but I love Apple. So when you buy an Apple product, it should be really an experience. When you buy a product or purchase a service, it should be an experience rather than buying a product or a service. So later on, we'll quickly look into customer experience and user experience and the customer journey. So the idea is how can you excite your customer um, and how can he really or she enjoy buying your product? And Brian says it's not about the price of a product. We might even be willing to pay more if the company is doing good. So what I'm saying is we're buying a product or a service and we're willing to pay and we're getting something. So that's an exchange. But I put down donate. So the idea is I might buy a product if the company is donating money. I might buy a product if it might be organic or if it might be sort of fair trade. So what I'm saying is people become more and more conscious and they wouldn't buy just anything. So they would be willing to buy something in exchange for the product, but also for the company doing good with that money. And of course, uh, in India, you are one of the most connected uh, countries in the world. So I'm sure you buy a lot online and you might not uh, buy that much in stores anymore. I personally, I'm old fashioned. I still like to go to stores, but my wife, she orders everything online from uh, dog uh, um, supplements for her dogs and clothing for our children and um, even sometimes food. And uh, she would buy furniture for our little terrace uh, behind the apartment. So she buys everything online so we could talk about everywhere. And evangelism uh, would replace promotion and promotion actually stands for advertising and um, public relations. So we can say nowadays we need our fans, our followers that would live and die for our products. Evangelism comes from the idea of the Christian gospel church where people sing in the church gospel and they praise the Lord and uh, we need people who praise our product. So a first step towards this new paradigm of marketing is one good example of the 4E model of Mr. Brian Fedestono from Oilivi. And you can see him down here. I'm also happy to share the slides uh, with uh, Mr. Sandeep Bansali so uh, you can all have them, of course, and look everything up. So um, we can agree, and especially I'm thinking of India, you have so many different languages and uh, well, uh, where would you, in which newspaper would you advertise on television? In which language would you advertise? Just think about direct mail. If you want to send out uh, flyers to people, to their homes, um, how much money that would cost. And billboards, for example, are interesting. In Germany, billboards are not allowed. They don't want billboards at the side of the highway because they say people get distracted. So you won't see any billboards. So the idea is these traditional models are sort of dying off. And I mean, newspapers and radio and television still exist. So dying off is maybe the wrong expression. They're still existing, but not at the same scale anymore. So um, advertising becomes cheaper. You don't reach that many people anymore. And everybody is moving towards digital marketing. So um, one thing that you'd have to be aware when you become an entrepreneur or when you work for a company and when you sell a product or a service, um, we have these sales funnels, and I'm sure you've seen different models of these sales funnels, and this is just an example. And the idea is you try to um, attract as many people as possible and make them aware of your company or your offering. And you somehow should create an interest in your company and your offerings. And then you will see, okay, can you please these potential clients? Um, in some case, you might negotiate with them. I mean, some prices are fixed. In the best of the case, you close the sale and a client is really only a client when you make him buy again. He buys once, she buys once, that's okay. 
but renewal is very important. So I want you to have in the back of your head the idea of the sales funnel. You try to attract as many people as possible to uh, get to know your company and your product. And the sales funnel should be very wide in the bottom. That means many people are actually going through that funnel. And this is just an example. So I, I'm inviting you to sort of dig a little deeper uh, because we only have one hour today in the idea of the sales funnel. This is a different um, model of a sales funnel. So um, what I find very important nowadays is retention and referral. So we try to find users, customers, we try to sort of convert them into what well, their prospects, potential customers, we try to convert them into customers and we should have them stay with us. Look at Netflix, Netflix, for example, or when you watch online, what I love is the idea I can um, cancel my subscription any moment. Would you um, have a Netflix or Amazon Prime or a Disney Plus or any other account for video on demand if you'd have to sign a one-year contract or a two-year contract? I would never, ever do it. Um, I would say, oh, no, I don't know. Maybe I don't like the videos and the series they're showing. And then I can only cancel my subscription after one year. So try to make everything possible with your clients that they feel um, comfortable and you will keep them uh, when you let them cancel from month to month. Don't make things too complicated and do good as a company uh, so that others tell um, others about you and your company. So referral becomes very important. We'll look into that in a minute also. So one thing that I want you to take along today, besides the idea of the 4E model, is the idea of the sales funnel. And that is uh, very interesting when you look at the different models and when you try to follow the idea of the sales funnel, trying to get as many people as possible into that funnel and try to get as many people out of the funnel at the bottom. So um, when we look at the idea um, in investing in our current clients and users, that's the best thing we can do. And also when we talk about a business school, a university, let's say one day you set up your own business school, your own university. I mean, your current students are your current users. So you should treat them in the best way and they should love your school and they will then later tell others. So that's just an example. Just think of a restaurant, do everything possible. I love to go to restaurants and I love that attention. I would sit there and when they even remember me and say, hey, Git, good to see you again. How are you doing? It was so nice seeing you the other day. So what I'm saying is try to invest in your current users because when they're at peak satisfaction, they might become ambassadors and they might uh, become part of the idea of the 4E model with the evangelism and they might refer to other people. And that's one of the extremely cost-effective ways of gaining new users. And one thing that plays an important role, for example, in Germany, uh, my wife would always look at the reviews. And my wife has a small little business. Um, she has a beauty salon and my wife is in a shopping center downtown Stuttgart and the two more uh, beauty centers. And she says, I have the best reviews. And I said, oh, I didn't imagine reviews play such an important role for your beauty salon. And she says, yes, clients are even coming from Switzerland and they would look online in the shopping center, which beauty salon has the best reviews and the best reputation. So my wife plays a very uh, close attention to her reviews and she would trick, do some tricks. Some people, she, they would, she would give them 20% discount if they write a nice review. So that's a bit of a trick. So um, I'm not saying that we should cheat, but uh, what I'm saying is try to do everything possible to have good reviews because that is also uh, an idea that is important today. And I don't know, Sandeep, in your case, you and me, do you look at reviews? I very often just go for it. Do we, you we use uh, the entire, we call it as an ORM, which is called as online reputation management. That itself is a big subject altogether in Indiana. Definitely, definitely. So we'd have to pay a close attention to that. Right. And I'm sure you have seen the idea of the net promoter score. And that idea of the net promoter score is something that gives you a, a, a very good feedback. So I very often get emails. I bought a new laptop the other day and I received an email and it said, how likely is it that you would recommend our company to a friend? Uh, you just recently bought a laptop with us and uh, they want me to, to answer either with nine or 10. It doesn't really matter if I answer nine or 10. 
Um, they don't want me to answer with seven or eight because then I'm out of the whole model. And they definitely don't want me to answer with one, two, or three, four, five, or six. What I'm trying to say is you can easily implement the idea of the net promoter score to get a real-time feedback of how your clients feel. And the idea is, um, let's say you have a 47, uh, we can talk about people. Let's take an example that we can say we have 47 people saying we um, are very likely to recommend your company to a friend. They've answered with nine or 10. So let's say 47 people to make it easy uh, answered nine or 10 38 people answered uh, seven or eight it doesn't matter if they answer seven or eight but these 38 people are out of our calculations and luckily only 15 people if we take that as an example um, I'm using percentage here but I want to make it as uh, easy as possible to understand so let's imagine we asked 47 people and they answered nine or ten and they would be the so-called promoters 38 people would have answered seven or eight. They're out of our calculations and only 15% said, um, well, well, um, something between one and six, either one. So that would mean we have a net promoter score of 32 or in that case, 32%. And the figure itself is not very helpful, but we can compare. We can ask the next month, the next year, we can compare ourselves to other companies so also another idea of uh, sort of the new paradigm for marketing nowadays is the net promoter score. And I also want you to look a little bit into that if you haven't seen that concept yet. Um, we already spoke about sort of the new paradigm for marketing. And um, please excuse, there are two German words in here, but it's not so um, important. I have another example later on. So the idea really is to think when you set up a company or when you're employed by a company, what is the actual journey a customer is going through? And uh, I'm sure if you come to think of it, you will all have examples when you booked something maybe online or when you bought something online or when you bought something in a, in a shop, um, you had this so-called customer journey. And uh, we can sort of break it up into awareness, consideration, acquisition, service, and loyalty. So how are you making your prospects, potential clients aware of your product or services? This could be with social media, public relations, online ads, flyers and posters. Empfehlungen is a German word that means uh, we are, it's a referral. And there's another German word here, Messe, which means a trade fair. And then um, while you make them aware, and let's say you work in business to business, you're not selling to final clients, you could offer white papers or you could get involved in blogs. Uh, companies like Bosch with uh, domestic appliances, household appliances, but also um, batteries and everything, they would have landing pages. You could um, publish ebooks so that people really um, consider you as an option. And then, uh, well, you must have a website or maybe an app or a shop uh, or, uh, well, a booking possibility so that people can buy your service or order from you. And then service is very important. Don't neglect the service. You always need good people who are very um, good, uh, let's say, maybe even sweet talkers who can calm people down. So don't forget to invest when you set up a company in your service, uh, in good call center people. Uh, so that they make everybody happy. And then later, uh, there's another German word. It says Angebot. They make some special offers. Contact your potential clients uh, with little surveys. Ask them, hey, we'll give you 5% or 10% discount next time if you take four minutes to answer a survey. Work with newsletters. So think of that whole customer journey that your clients are going through. And this is an example of the customer journey map. So this is another interesting um, model. I've used another one. Also, the customer journey, uh, this one is talking about awareness, consideration, purchase, retention, and advocacy at the end. So the idea would be, uh, how do you make people sort of uh, think of, um, yeah, how would they um, talk about you, refer you word of mouth, and so on. Um, well, the idea is, um, when we think about the customer journey, the customer journey helps marketers understand, our marketers understand the series of connected experience that customers desires and needs. So um, we could say the customer journey helps us really understand, okay, how uh, and what do we have to look into? Um, what are the desires and needs of our customers? And what is the journey they're actually going through? 
I want to give you a short example of a, a car rental broker. Um, I quite often used to rent cars uh, when I was on business trips and I had to go to Spain. So in Spain, I rented a car online in Germany, and this is a typical broker company, so they wouldn't have their own cars. And they would give you a big overview and say, this is the price with that company, that's the price with that company, that's the good thing with that company, that's the bad thing with that company. So I flew from Germany to Switzerland and I had a connecting flight from Switzerland to Spain. And um, when I was in the in the plane in, uh, in Switzerland, it left late and I was quite early getting to Switzerland. So in Switzerland, I thought I will never arrive in time with my next flight to Spain. So I wanted to call the company and say, guys, I'm coming later. So I booked the car with this broker uh, page. It says cheaper rental cars is the translation. And um, well, I booked the car through them with a with a Spanish company, Centro Auto. And I called Centro Auto and I said, hey, guys, I have a car with you. I booked it through that broker uh, today. And I said, we don't have a booking from you here. I'm like, that's strange. I booked it with a broker. So I thought I need to call the broker immediately. And I don't know how it is in India, but some companies in Germany are very rude. They have very expensive phone numbers. You call them and have these super expensive phone numbers. And I was sitting in Switzerland in a different country with my mobile phone. And I thought, oh no, if they only have like a very expensive phone number. So I looked it up and I had a normal landline in Cologne in Germany. So I called the normal landline in Cologne and said, I, I booked the car with you guys, um, uh, through you guys with a Spanish company, but they said they don't have a booking. So the lady said, let me check. And she said, you booked the car for next week. And I said, oh no, I made a mistake. And she said, don't worry, I'll cancel it immediately and I'll book you a new car in a few seconds. So she said, I have two offers here. So she canceled my wrong booking. She booked a new car for me within two minutes. I had a new contract there in my inbox. So I was super happy. So from now on, I will only only use this company because um, I made a mistake. They canceled my booking for free. They booked me a new uh, car within uh, seconds. And after two minutes, I hung up and had a new contract in my inbox. So I was super happy. So what I'm saying is I'm not advertising for this company. I'm saying is in the case of Germany, Put up a phone number that people can call and don't make it an expensive phone number. Make it a simple landline with no cost secures or even think about you covering the cost for the phone call and then have excellent um, salespeople there or customer care people who solve problems. So I was super impressed. So that's what I'm talking about. That's important nowadays because there's so much competition out there. And Uber is a good example. I used it in India. And uh, in India, my experience was that Uber or taxi, it was pretty much the same. It was the same price, I would say, in other countries, like in the United States, Uber was significantly cheaper. So I was very happy with Uber and Uber, they're using their existing clients, find, trying to find new clients. So imagine uh, Mr. Sandeep uh, would get an email, say, hey, invite your friends to Uber and you get $10 off. So um, Mr. Sandeep would send a couple of emails to friends and they would sign up for Uber. The time they booked their first trip, Mr. Sunday would get $10. So that's super cheap advertising. So I'm trying to think with our new paradigm of marketing, new model of marketing, how can we use our existing clients? If they're happy, they will refer word of mouth and help us to find new clients, so to say. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I um, am happy, as you can see, for example, I'm prepared this PowerPoint presentation. No, sorry, it's keynote. It's a keynote presentation. I'm happy with the keynote presentation, but I'm not very fond of Google Analytics or any other analytics software. So what I'm saying is if you guys set up a company and uh, you always have to know what's going on. And I don't know if you like coffee. I love coffee. So in the morning, you should get up and have coffee. And the first thing you should do is check uh, your uh, your figures and you should use uh, programs like Google Analytics or any other programs. But what I'm saying is I am not that kind of person. So if you're not that kind of person who likes to work with analytics, I love to work with numbers, but I love to work with Excel, but I'm just not the person for the analytics program. So have somebody in your team who loves to analyze and to check out correlations and work with these programs. What I'm saying is nowadays, you can't set up a company, you can't work in a company uh, without actually analyzing your data. And if you're like me, if you don't like to analyze data, have somebody who loves to juggle around with data 
you need that person and that person is one of your key people in your team. So if you don't like analyzing data, have and hire that person. Um, and if it's a friend, it's always nice to combine friends, family and business. And we all know Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos says, if you double the number of experiments you do per year, you're going to double your inventiveness. So Jeff Bezos was experimenting, experimenting, experimenting. I'm 44 now. So I remember when Jeff Bezos started with books online and he didn't make any money. He lost money and people laughed about him. Nowadays, he owns airports. He bought airports. He has supermarkets with no employees. So the guy was always experimenting. So what I'm saying is you have to be innovative. You have to research. You have to experiment. And by the way, do you know which one is the company in the world that is spending the highest amount of all companies in uh, research and development? Do you know? Honestly, I would have also always thought, well, the company that invests most money in research and development must be a pharmaceutical company, but it's not. Um, does anybody know the company that invests the highest amounts ever in research and development every year is Amazon. Amazon is the company that has the highest expenditures of all companies in research and development. So Jeff Bezos really is experimenting, inventing, innovative and researching. And that is what you have to do. Um, so if you um, are not that creative, besides the person who analyzes data in your team, you need your um, very innovative experimenting, researching guy within your team. And then um, one of my favorite topics is growth hacking. And you uh, might have heard of uh, Sean Ellis, who started the whole growth hacking movement in the United States. And um, if you haven't heard of Sean Ellis, that's not a problem. You might have heard of Dropbox. Uh, Sean Ellis was working with Dropbox and Dropbox uh, was um, always winning new clients without investing too much in um advertising so i invite you to read a little bit about growth hacking and sean ellis and growth hacking is experiment driven marketing so what i'm trying to say part of the new paradigm of marketing is experimenting 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 researching uh doing checking out things so i want you to look a little more into the growth hacking experiment driven marketing um for our new paradigm of marketing and uh, I love the growth hacking topic so much that I started a growth hacking master uh, program uh, in English, in German, and a growth hacking bachelor program with my universities. So I designed one. So I'm uh, very fond of growth hacking. So that's a topic that uh, is part of the new paradigm of marketing. And we already spoke um, about growth hacking. And one of my favorite examples, I'm sorry, this is an old screenshot from Airbnb, but they managed to hack growth and uh, growth hacking. I mean, it stands for growing and hacking. That means besides the, sorry, besides the experiment driven marketing, it means we're trying to try out things and we don't want to invest too much money in traditional marketing. So what Airbnb did, they worked, um, well, they have this beautiful web page now. They used Craigslist and Craigslist is super big in the United States. So people, when they were trying to sell something, uh, let's say they want to sell stuff, a phone or a t television or, well, even uh, if you wanted to find somebody for a date or if you needed a musician or if you wanted uh, like a babysitter, Craigslist was the page itself. It was the big thing in the US. So Airbnb started uh, with their um, first ads on Craigslist because everybody was using Craigslist. So they never really had to invest in advertising because people were on Craigslist anyways and they were referred when they were looking for a room to stay over to Airbnb. And that's how the whole company grew big. I could talk an hour about um, uh, Airbnb, how the company was not successful at all in the beginning, how investors were laughing at them. And now they're bigger than Hilton or Hyatt. And uh, their page used to look like that. Air bed and breakfast, forget hotels, sign up, sign in, stay with the local when traveling. So I could talk an hour about that, but we only have about 20 minutes left. So I want to come towards an end so that we can still have questions and answers and a discussion. So Airbnb, read the story of how they were growing big and hacking, using hacks and analyzing their data. They were actually checking out, talking about analyzing their data. They found out that rooms, hotels that they're renting out that didn't have professional pictures taken were not rented that much. So rooms, 
hold, uh, rooms, um, apartments, houses with professional pictures were three to four times more often rented out than apartments or rooms or houses with not professional pictures. So what Airbnb did, they checked their data and they found that out and they hired up to 3,000 photographers at the same time. Up to 3,000 photographers all over the world paid by Airbnb to go and take pictures for free of the rooms, houses, and apartments so that they have professional pictures online so that these rooms, houses, and uh, apartments were uh, more likely to be rented out. So that's uh, an excellent example of how they were analyzing their data and then they were acting uh, upon the whole idea. So um, my idea was to more or less talk until um, quarter two. So uh, if Mr. Sandeep uh, agrees, we would have 15 minutes to discuss a little bit. I'm very fond of hearing not only your questions, but also your ideas uh, about uh, what do you think, do we need a new paradigm for marketing? So you can ask me questions, fire them out, but I'm also happy to hear your opinion about paradigm for marketing. I'm very happy to hear about your business ideas, about your uh, how you um, maybe have uh, thought about something innovative or if you've seen something innovative, some new business models. And I invite you very much to do as much, much research as you can to sort of uh, think of, uh, um, well, things that are not there and maybe your solution is uh, the next big thing. And I mean, we can't reinvent the wheel, but uh, maybe one of you is going to be the next Jeff Bezos. You never know. I mean, you are our future. I'm getting old. I'm 44. So you are our future. So the question is really, what do you think? What uh, ideas do you have? And um, what might you have seen that is interesting? Great, sir. I, I must say, uh, Dr. George, it was really amazing and a very, very inspiring, uh, very informative session we had today. I must say, we have, uh, I would say, it's, it were, these were the eye openers. I call it as an eye openers. The reason be the lot of models which you have been using or in a simplest possible form, which you have uh, made us understand what marketing is all about, what sales is all about. The nice example which you spoke about Airbnb. Today, we see a lot of classifieds on various platforms, but those classified gets more number of traffic or uh, they say attention, which has more good pictures. So you, you build a belief system that yes, when, when I am online or probably when you are online, when we are visible to the audience, that is when we build the trust. In case if we turn it off our videos and if it just keeps speaking, I'm sure nobody would be able to connect us. So thank you so much for, for such a wonderful uh, examples, uh, Dr. George. So we'll, we'll take up, uh, there are a lot of questions, but we'll, we'll see as the time permits, we'll take up those. So the first question has been asked by one of the participants, Mr. Shiva Shankaran. He says, my question is, which is the most difficult problem faced by you? Can you tell me some story on that? What was the biggest problem which you have faced? It? Um, well, one of the biggest problems I really see is to, to kick off and start. So you might have an idea and you might say, hey, um, I'm not sure if I'm capable. So you should really go for it. And we are all not capable of doing everything. So that's with the example of the data analysis, try to um, meet up and get the right people on your team. So for example, um, I um, nowadays work a lot in online marketing, but I had to learn everything about online marketing. So my partner, Roman Jakob, you remember with Boucher and Jakob, our online consult uh, our sales and marketing Amazing. consultancy, we work a lot with online marketing. My partner was a super expert on online marketing. So I was the guy sort of setting up the contracts, finding the clients, and he was um, uh, sort of setting up everything online. Uh, just to give you an example, we had many companies from outside of Germany who wanted to enter the German speaking market. So don't hesitate, uh, get started when you wanna set up your own thing and um, meet up with the right people, get them on your team. That is uh, for me, that was a big step to overcome, but we just did it. Great, sir. thank you so much. I I, uh, I would say this resembles one of the thought of our managing director, Mr. Ritesh Goel. He says always the first step to do anything is to figure out the first step. So as, as you rightly said that just go ahead, just start your things where you want to start. 
Thank you so much yeah. for that. Thank you. Next question has been asked by Sanket Chandra. He's, uh, sir, is traditional marketing paradigm still effective in today's rapidly evolving digital landscape? Well, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we are talking about television, radio, and newspaper being dead, but it's still around, right? And I can give you a good example. I was always seeing um, this band advertised. Uh, I used to like hip hop very much. This band from the United States from Los Angeles called Cypress Hill. So I saw them. I saw posters in Stuttgart in my city. I saw uh, screens, big television screens uh, with Cypress Hill. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I listened to that a band 30 years ago and I thought it's on the 15th of August so I never really thought about it and on the 14th of August I saw one of the posters again for Cypress Hill so I said tomorrow is the concert and it was the 15th of uh, August and I saw so many posters and television screens outside screens so I thought uh, not television screens but you know these big screens uh, that you can see outside uh, in the road and then I bought a ticket quickly online and I went to the concert and I, I Felt like a little kid, I was so happy. I had tears in my eyes listening to the pop band that years ago could still work with posters or, uh, like, like I told you in Germany, billboards are not um, um, allowed, but we have these big screens uh, in the city centers. So um, it always depends a little bit about your idea and your business. So if you could still sort of win clients with traditional marketing techniques, then still go for them. And if you can still win clients by advertising in a newspaper or on radio, do it. But uh, maybe you can find many more clients when you start uh, with online marketing or with Google ads or uh, when you get into growth hacking. So it's really all about digging deep into the topic, uh, informing yourself, finding out, doing research on the different models and ideas and then just give it a go and go for it. Super, sir. thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes, it does work depending on the idea of what you have. So if traditional works, go ahead with traditional or if it is something related to the youth, probably you can go to the social media or digital era as well. So moving ahead with the next question uh, has been asked by Devaji. He says, uh, he's basically an undergraduate student. So I would like to ask about the current challenges in traditional marketing strategies. Potential shift in the consumer behavior in the emerging era? Uh, very interesting question. So um, you always need specialists in your team. And I mean, for example, if you would invite me today to work with you in India, you guys are the specialists. I wouldn't really be the specialist. You would be the you would know consumer behavior and you would know about certain markets. So uh, I would say um, it's could completely wrong in India. I would love to work in India. I love India, uh, especially I was amazed by the food. So I'm just trying to give you that example. Um, even though I might uh, have a certain experience, I might be the complete wrong guy. So what I'm trying to say is uh, you always need local people. You always need people that you can talk to. And uh, I've even seen advertising agencies by kids that they were 14. I was absolutely impressed. I saw these little kids, they were 14, and they weren't legally even allowed to set up their own company because you have to be 18. So their parents had to set up the company for them. So what I'm trying to say is these young kids in Germany set up an advertising agency and said, we're 14 and we're your target group. And you need to hire us as a company to really find out how young people uh, think. So what I'm trying to say is to answer your question, um, um, also, you always need local people on your team and you always need to talk to people and find out about their desires and needs and then you will find the right strategy and uh, you would uh, uh, be successful, hopefully. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. And the next question is, sir, as someone from marketing, you would, of course, know the importance of networking. So as a first year students, how do we go about it? Excellent. I was always very involved in networking. I don't like the term networking because it sounds like I'm networking with Mr. Sandeep trying to get some opportunity for me out of it, but it's not that. My idea of networking really is, um, I mean, networking sometimes has a negative uh, touch to it. So my idea of networking is that you hang around with people that you feel comfortable with. So I would never ever join an organization with people I don't like. I would never ever join a political party 
if they have ideas that I don't like. I would never ever join an organization where I think the, I don't like the people. So what I did is I very early started joining student organizations, student clubs with ideas that I like. Just to give an example, uh, the one we had one at my university when I did a bachelor degree, we were helping foreign students uh, when they came to Germany, setting up a bank account, going with them to the different, uh, well, uh institutions where they had to go so do something that you like and only join clubs and organizations where you feel comfortable with um i later joined an organization like the rotary club stuttgart uh, rotary club international i'm joining this uh senator program of european uh, um what is it called uh board of board of senators board of european senators so to say so i'm always looking out for organizations that i can join and it's not because i'm thinking hey can i make some money with it but i'm thinking i'm looking forward to meeting interesting people and if i meet interesting people you never know what project might come up so uh, in your case check out what is your uh, university offering what is the business school offering what is uh, offered on a local level what is maybe offered on an international level what is offered online but just join organizations that you're fond of and where you like the people because otherwise you will not feel comfortable Absolutely. That's that's really very, very important that do the do the thing which you love the most. Just don't get exactly. into the heck of doing it. Right. Thank you so much for that, sir. Let's let's we'll take another about a couple of questions more uh, since we are running short of time. So the next question is being asked by uh, Shane Bhaga Shruti. She says, Man, according to you, which brand is most future forecasted? Uh, that is also an excellent question. Uh, the sad thing is I don't have this glass uh, bowl that I can look into and foresee the future. And um, maybe you might even know better than I do. But uh, it's very interesting when you look at the sports brand. In Germany, we used to like Nike, even though Adidas is from Germany, Puma is from Germany. I never really liked Puma. And suddenly Under Armour came up. I'm not a great fan of Under Armour, but it was amazing to see even in Chicago how they have this big flagship store so it's super interesting to see like in the sports sector how the armor suddenly came up in germany you know i'm in visit me i'll take you to the museum and, and the port from my from stuttgart we have been in w -S and um they've always been a little stupid sorry to use that word but i mean they thought hey we have these excellent cars but when you look now to China, when you look to India, well, in China, there will be so many electrical cars coming onto the market at affordable price. If you look at Tata, you'll never know what will happen with Tata, like a super big company. Um, there's Indian companies buying more and more companies in Germany. So what I'm trying to say is it will be very interesting to see how the whole uh, car sector will carry on, how Tesla will work, how the China these brands will some of the credit cards is and then with brands uh, what i find surprising coca-cola and pepsi cola they're aware that they have products that are not healthy so they started test in juices and juices are also very bad so it will be very interesting to see also when you look at um, nutrition, for example, what food brands might be coming up. And um, so there is so many different possibilities. So maybe you exactly will be the one that will come up with the next super product uh, that will be successful. You never know. Great. Thank you. So thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question is being asked by Ganapati. He says, my question is currently business think twice to spend on digital marketing and traditional marketing. Do you think it would be easy for them to adapt, adapt the growth hacking? Yes, the growth hacking is really a sort of a mixture of online marketing or digital marketing and uh, IT. So also, I'm not an IT specialist, so I would always also need my IT partner. And growth hacking is the idea, how can we uh, reach growth without having to invest too much money in traditional marketing. And again, I'm not saying you don't have to, you should not spend any money on television or radio or the newspaper. I'm saying, think of how you can sort of avoid expenditures on how you can sort of um, win new clients. And even Heineken, as one of the major beer brands, when they set up their brewery in the Netherlands and nobody wanted to buy their beer, 
So the owner, he hired students and he said that that was over 100 years ago. And he said, go to the bars and ask for Heineken beer. And when they said they don't have it, just leave. So he paid the students and the students walked into the bars and said, oh, can I have a Heineken beer? And they said, Heineken beer, we don't have it. Okay, thank you. Bye. So that was growth hacking without any IT back then or 100 years ago. And then eventually these bars and restaurants had to contact the brewery and said, can we have Heineken beer? And nobody knew that the students were paid by the company. So growth hacking is really about being innovative, about researching, about experimenting. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use traditional marketing anymore. And I think you should always know about the different models that we looked at and traditional marketing and digital marketing. And then if you come up with your own growth hack, meaning how can you really grow your company uh, without having to spend too much on traditional marketing, then you're on the right track. That's that's absolutely right. I, I think that there's one brand I saw somewhere, Recollect. There's one brand, the chips manufacturing brand, uh, I think did the same thing where they had about six college students and uh, they, they did the same activity, I would say. So they used to send the guys to the shops and say, hey, do you have these chips? Mm-hmm. Every day, one person used to come and ask for the same chips. And the seventh day, the person, the shopkeeper has to go back to the company and say, come on, do supply me chips because there are a lot of clients, people are coming and asking your chips. So that, that's a creative way to enhance their market. Uh, I, I have another good example. I, I, I'm always convinced with little gifts. I love little gifts and I love gifts with different brands name on it. So Fanta, a popular brand uh, by Coca-Cola. I think it was India where they introduced Fanta and what they did, they gave out free pens. And I would have loved one of these pens with the Fanta color and the Fanta logo. So people started buying Fanta because they wanted to have the free pens. And I would immediately fall for that. And it's not so complicated. You can easily give out pens if people then start buying Fanta and get used to it. But I don't recommend you guys drink Fanta. I'm always telling my daughter, she's 10 years old, no Fanta because it's very bad uh, with the sugar. But still, once in a while, she can have it. Absolutely right, sir. So the freebies are always attracts more clients, I would say. Definitely. In any any form, they can give the freebies. Not need not be materialistic. Itself. Definitely. Right. Thank you so much, sir. The last question we'll take up for the evening. Uh, good evening, sir. My question is, what can the best approach to increase the website traffic? Um, I love that question. And it's one of my favorite topics because we're really talking about search engine marketing in that case. And it's super interesting because uh, when I ask people what is Google, they would say it's a search engine. And I would say, well, for me, it's not a search engine. For me, it's one of the most powerful advertising platforms in the world because when you look at it, we have these ads on top. So the idea is uh, we want to get as many people as possible on our webpage so we could work with the keywords. So you'd have to look into search engine advertising and Google ads used to be called Google AdWords. But if you say, I don't want to spend money on Google ads, um, well, you want to get involved in search engine optimization. And Google says there are more than 200 parameters of how you can sort of rank, how you can rank your page higher, how your page would come up on top. So basically, um, Google, of course, is not talking uh, officially about these 200 parameters. But uh, one thing is, for example, if you sell, let's say, cars online, uh, your web page should be called www.cars-online.com, for example. So that means if you buy, uh, if you sell a certain product, that should best be in your domain. Links is still interesting. You should have links on other pages. You should have people writing and talking about your uh, product, your page. I did one thing with one product. Um, we were selling asphalt online. Uh, called asphalt online 25 kilos in buckets and we wrote many articles about it and of course nobody would read an article about this product so we placed these articles on a platform where journalists could uh, search for articles so we placed all these articles on these uh, platform on these pages for journalists so google was scanning the internet and they said oh there are articles about that product these articles were never ever published but they were online on in this database for journalists. So uh, if you have articles about your product, even though if you only place them in platforms where other people could use these articles, that's another interesting thing. So you should uh, look uh, into search engine marketing, SEM, search engine advertising, uh, SEA, and search engine optimization, SEO. 
absolutely sir so thank you so much for that where with the help of seo sem i'm sure you get a lot of traffic which can can be redirected towards your probably the website or the landing page of yours thank you so much uh, dr george it was really amazing having you and addressing our audience with such clarity and expertise you had on that so on behalf of the entire gibs uh, family uh, i would love to extend my heartfelt gratitude to you thank you to you for being with us being a keynote speaker on today's session and sharing your valuable insights with us your journey from a commerce graduate to a successful entrepreneur is truly commendable i must say and we are really uh, grateful for guiding uh, all of us uh, during this webinar and uh, i would also like to thank all our uh, attendees for active participation and engagement you your guys you guys enthusiasm is amazing i must say and this has led to a successful session of today's ire talk so thank you so much uh, dr george once again and i would love to give one small announcement uh, to our audience uh, kindly note that the certificate of today's webinar would be shared in next two days uh, that's on uh, 20th of august you will be receiving your uh, certificates on your official email id and uh, one uh, small announcement i would love to make here is the next upcoming uh, ire talk uh, that's uh, that's already been scheduled and uh, that's on next 29th that's on 29th of august it has been scheduled 4:30 pm by ms vibha so ms vibha uh, gupta is and the topic is uh, building your personal brand as an entrepreneur say so again as we are under the ire talks so the next topic is building your personal brand as an entrepreneur by ms brinda gupta uh, ms vibha gupta is a jo stock speaker soft skill coach public speaker and a content creator employed with physics wala so looking forward to see you all once again on 29th and dr george i would again extend my heartfelt gratitude for you for joining with us it was really amazing having you with us today thank you sir thank you so much for joining in it was an honor thank you so much for inviting me thank you sir we would love to host you at uh, gibs sir any day you're there in india we would love to host you at campus So please do let us know in case any time you're coming down to India, we would love to host you at the campus. Yeah, we can always organize something. I'm always happy to come. That would be a, a great honor. Uh, let's uh, let's stay in touch and see if we um, plan something together. Thank you so much. Certainly, certainly, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Have a great time ahead. Thank you. Thank you. You too. All the best. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.